it brings me to a humble place where, when I'm covering my head that it's not about me, it's not about my looks, that I'm really here on this earth. My whole purpose is to just worship God and bring glory to Him. Over the years, it's come to be very significant, something that's very, very special. Uh, and I was always treat my veil with great respect. We always kiss our veil before we take it, before we put it on. In the first epistle to the Corinthians, in the 11th chapter and the 10th verse, Paul uses these words. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Apparently, some of the women in the church at Corinth were taking part in prayer with their heads uncovered. And the apostle tells them that that's quite wrong. It's something that just helps me in my prayer life and my relationship to God and my relationship to other people as well. To see 1 Corinthians 11 in the middle of a book that we read from all the time, but we're just ignoring this one part. We take it all so literally, especially 1 Corinthians 13, which is called the chapter of love. It's often read at weddings. It's often like love is patient, love is kind. And it's literally just a few chapters away, this, this head coverings verse. So how can we ignore it? Covering is mostly a requirement for married women in Judaism. It's the source is from a biblical text. It's a reminder of God's presence with me at all times. It's kind of a big old wedding ring. While veiling is often seen as a visual manifestation of the Islamic faith, it is a tradition far from confined to this religion. In the last few decades, the head covering has been greatly disassociated from Western religion and culture. It is perceived by the media as a tool of female oppression and symptomatic of a patriarchal society. But Islam is not the first Abrahamic faith that strongly emphasized the notion of decency and modesty through a specific dress code for both females and males. What evidence exists for the female head covering within Christian and Jewish scriptures? Why is the head covering no longer a practice prevalent in modern Western societies? Through biblical scripture, literature, and art, this documentary investigates the origins of the veiling tradition within two major world religions. We speak to a number of academics, as well as women from various Jewish and Christian communities who have chosen to cover their hair as a means of modesty, obedience, and gaining closeness to God. Dating back to the inception of Judaism, veiling has been perceived by many early civilizations as a symbol of nobility and dignity. This was reinforced with the subsequent arrival of Christianity, whose scriptures make explicit reference to an ideal dress code ordained by the Almighty. Although the use of head coverings has diminished over the centuries, it has maintained its significance and implementation within many Orthodox Christian and Jewish denominations. It's interesting. I think one of the things that we notice when we think about veiling is that we have is that it's a very ambiguous or kind of amorphous term, and so we always have to think about being a little more specific. Are we thinking about veiling that covers the entire face? Are we thinking about veiling which simply uh, covers the covers the head as something akin to a head scarf, or something that really is meant to be representational of an act of veiling where a certain portion of the head is covered? But the, but the rest of it, for all intents and purposes, is left uncovered. We have in the New Testament uh, traditions that uh, it's clear women are being asked to veil for religious reasons. So we have in 1 Corinthians, Paul gives us a tradition, which is a very clear tradition, uh, that women should be veiling when they're prophesying or praying and men, and men in the ancient Near East were covering their head, men, when they pray and they prophesy, they should not be uh, covering their, their heads. So we have this new wrinkle. Now, what are the reasons for that? There are a lot of uh, historians of uh, ancient Christianity that think that this is an attempt to create a new identity for Christianity, where women are going to be 
uh, veiled so that they are um, doing it for religious reasons within this new church. So we have um, that as part of early Christianity. The first time I was ever confronted with head covering was when I attended for the first time a church that head covered. I walked into the service a little bit late and I was confronted with a sea of white lace heads of women who had mentilla lace head coverings on. And I was like, what is this? This is weird. <laughs> and so after that church service, I went home and I started researching. I was like, where is this in the Bible? What does it say? How come we interpret it differently? Why doesn't anyone else do it? Why is it all old ladies and not culture now? So I started reading and I found that there was a large chunk of scripture that actually was dedicated to head coverings. The verses of the Bible which form the basis of female veiling practice within Christianity, especially when in church or during prayer, originate from St. Paul and his letters to the Corinthians. Corinth was an ancient city located on the peninsula of South Greece. The majority of these letters address many practical issues which may arise in the local church, including the veiling of women. St. Paul lays special emphasis on the head covering as part of a modest dress code which should be adhered to by females, particularly in a religious text. So Paul writes in the letter of, of 1 Corinthians, he says, But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the husband is the head of the wife. So already we're getting into territory that some, um, some moderns would find, um, would rub them in the wrong direction. And he says, God is the head of Christ. Um, so you also have a, uh, for some people, a, a, perhaps a, a problematic um, sense of hierarchies that are being established, and you're having human relationships modeled on a, uh, on a divine hierarchy. Any man who, who prays or prophesies uh, with something on his head disgraces his head. So of course this is very different from, uh, from Jewish practice, right, where it's very important for the man to, to cover his head. But any woman who prays or prophesies with her head unveiled disgraces her head. So you can see the very different standards of, um, of appearance, especially before God, in, a sense, in different senses of dignity based on his, his, uh, his sense of gender relations, which are very much of his own, his own period and his, of his time. We go back to that phrase, but any woman who prays or prophesies with her head unveiled disgraces her head. It is one and the same thing as having her head shaved. Um, so that sense of, of, uh, of utter nakedness and a sense of degradation of being shaved. For if a woman will not veil herself, then she should cut off her hair. So there you have an option here, one which he thinks is, of course, not itself really much of an option. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or to be shaved, she should wear a veil, he says. For a man ought not to have his head veiled, since he is the image and reflection of God. My favorite parts about the verse is because of the angels. There is no arguing there that angels are eternal. And my other favorite part of this, this chapter is that woman is not independent from man and woman and man not woman. So it's not about me being subservient to him and me being his servant and he's over me as a master, but rather we're still together and equal. But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. For her hair is given to her for a covering. But if anyone is disposed to be contentious, we have no such custom, nor do the churches of God. So that's a very interesting statement that for her hair is given to her for a covering. So in a way, what Paul is suggesting here is that the woman needs the symbol of authority of a man and a sense of the true hierarchy of relations as they stand before God. Um, but not only, but in a way, it's a double covering, right? Because her hair is the self meant to mask her or shade her in some way. And then she needs to have that, that covered again. To see 1 Corinthians 11 in the middle of a book that we read from all the time, but we're just ignoring this one part. We take it all so literally, especially 1 Corinthians 13, which is called the chapter of love. It's often read at uh, weddings, it's often like love is patient, love is kind, love does not, blah, blah, blah. like everyone knows that. And it's literally just a few chapters away, this, this head coverings verse. 
So how can we ignore it? And we take that literally, but we don't take this literally? I struggled with that, and that's why I take it literally. When we think of an archetypal female figure, of course, we're reminded of the Virgin Mary. And the Virgin Mary, of course, we might expect her to be present in the very earliest Christian art of the catacombs. And some people have argued that some female figures in catacomb art from the third century, uh, uh, from a very early Christian period, are the Virgin Mary. I think that that's yet to be established. Um, what we do see is that the Virgin Mary becomes a prominent figure in Christian art from the fifth, but especially from the sixth century onwards. And really, uh, along that historical scope, running from the fifth or the 6th century onwards, we see almost exclusively that the Virgin Mary is shown with her head covered. But of course, that would be very normal for all Christian women of that period, and it would certainly also follow on from the logic established by Paul in, um, in 1 Corinthians. So within Christianity, you have this veiling practice. Women are wearing something that's covering their heads. Uh, it's not necessarily uh, a very big veil that covers the face, but it clearly is being used when they're in a religious context. Um, then we have the whole beginnings of religious iconography within Christianity. So in religious iconography, we look at the church and we see that Mary, the mother of Jesus, is not only portrayed wearing some kind of head covering, but she's, it's a veil with a uh, halo, with a, an extremely uh, respectful uh, idea that she is representing herself as uh, in a new status. But this is not what becomes the next stage, which is when we have the beginnings of nuns within Christianity, they're wearing a very specific type of veil. Some of it looks like the kind of veils that we saw in the Greco-Roman period, but now this habit or this extreme, uh, very stabilized uh, type of veil is a veil that um, signals that their new status with their relationship to J Jesus. Now Jesus is now uh, almost like their husbands. So just like the rabbinic idea that women were veiling as they became um, uh, married, uh, so too the nuns are wearing a veil that seems to signal that they are in some kind of very intimate relationship with Jesus. The veiling of nuns in many Christian denominations is derived from the idea that that which is consecrated to God must always be veiled. Not only is a nun's veil a sign of consecration to God, it has also evolved to be a bridal symbolism, to represent that she is a bride of Christ and a sign of devotion to the vows she has made to God. My name is Sister Francisca. I'm a poor class sister belonging to the community in Arkley, which is in Barnet in North London. Um, I've been a nun for 55 years. Uh, I do um, a lot of cooking in our community and a lot of administration work. Um, I also do a certain amount of lecturing and um, publish papers and written work. My experience of wearing a veil, um, which is part of our whole dress, it's part of our habit, um, it ranges from the very negative to having been spat at and sworn at in the street, right through the whole gamut to the opposite end of the spectrum where somebody's tried to kiss my hand on Paddington Station, which was extremely embarrassing. Um, but it's usually somewhere in the middle. People acknowledge that um, this is you dress like this because of your dedication, because of the way you live in the same way that a nurse's uniform or a soldier or a policeman, that's telling people what their function in life is. Um, the nun's habit is, is similar. And people, even sometimes people with no faith at all, they might not agree with 
the dedication that's behind it, but they do respect, well, here is somebody who has given their life for a particular cause, particular reason, and that is why they dress the way they do. Certainly when we're out, I mean, in Tesco's or you know, doing the shopping, um, people would come up and say, oh, sister, I, I have such a big problem. You know, my, my child is ill or um, my mother's dying or my husband's gone off with another woman or um, there's this situation in my life. Please, will you pray for me? Um, and they, they find it a great help to be able to talk to us about their, their difficulties. From antiquity to the present in, uh, in Western culture, and especially if we look to the history of European art, it, it's very irregular to see a woman who's, who's not in some way having at least some portion of her head covered. So that is the, the, the general blanket um, expectation we might have when looking to images of women. We have depictions of uh, the Virgin Mary. We expect her to be uh, to be veiled to some degree. And then it becomes uh, something where she is meant to be an exemplar to all other women and sort of both in, in, in many ways raised up, but raised up because of her, her, her modesty. And in some ways, some could argue of her subservience and, and humility in that way as well. So, it's, uh, so if anyone is going to be uh, veiled, all the more so the Virgin Mary. The University of Hartford uh, has this small museum uh, where we feature uh, student exhibits. This uh, exhibit was called Veiled Women. And four years ago when we did this exhibit, we had thousands of people come in and they all wanted to know uh, something that they, they didn't realize, that women in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all in antiquity, and right up until the modern period, were veiling for, for a variety of different reasons. In the exhibit, when we, when we tried to look for, for examples of this, uh, we chose 24 photographs. Many of these photographs uh, were put up on, on the wall, and students would come in, and what was very interesting was uh, all the docents who took the students around asked the same question. Is this woman Jewish, Christian, or Muslim? And what was very interesting was that in some cases, they couldn't identify whether the person, the woman wearing the, uh, the scarf was Jewish, Christian, or Muslim. That was a very important educational uh, moment because what it did was it taught students, community people who came in, is that this is a practice that could be done in any one of those religions. Hello, I'm Elizabeth Dalston. I'm a stay-at-home wife and mother, and um, I run a small business from home, um, making, well, generally children's clothes, but I also make mantillas and chapel veils. I'm a Roman Catholic. I'm, I attend a more traditional form of the Mass, where it's said in Latin. I started my business really because um, I home-educated my son, and I know a lot of home-educating mothers, and they were saying to me they can't find decent, modest dresses for their children, uh, their little girls usually. That's what they were looking for. Um, so I said, well, I can sew. If anybody wants me to make clothes, I'll make them. So I, it just really started from there. I currently attend a non-denominational church, though when I first started head covering, I did attend a church where every woman had covered. I felt very confident in a church where there was head covering because it didn't feel abnormal, it felt accepted, and it felt like we were truly following what scripture said. Though the church I currently go to, since I've moved, does not head cover. But they accept the fact that I head cover. I've talked to the pastor about it. They encourage me to continue doing so. And so I'm confident and comfortable in head covering in my church now. There are different denominations of Christianity, of course, that we can talk about. Uh, we have uh, modern denominations in America, that um, are different than their European counterparts. But um, Roman Catholicism, uh, which historically had this very clear practice of women veiling uh, for religious moments uh, uh, in, the, in the church, um, has 
now passed into some type of non-mandatory status. Uh, we find in the, in the Greek Orthodox, in the Orthodox world of Christianity, that there still is this, um, uh, this idea that women should veil when they come into the church, especially when they're coming in to pray. And within cer certain denominations of Protestantism, we still see that, uh, um, that it's still uh, prevalent. But things have changed. Uh, since the, the uh, uh, Vatican II, um, Roman Catholicism has not uh, made it as uh, mandated as it was in, a, in the pre-Vatican II in the 1962 uh, era uh, up until the present time. Um, but within the, the Orthodox Church especially, we do find that there is still the, the practice of veiling. Brethren churches um, and Mennonite will often cover their heads. The style of worship that follows those is typically piano and voices, just very raw, so to speak, whereas a lot of modern churches are trying to accommodate to the secular person, someone who likes the secular music, likes um, culture, they're very much a part of culture, and head covering is not a part of Western culture. So a lot of people will struggle with that. They will think it's oppressive to women, but I think it's liberating, but it doesn't go so well with those churches, although they will say, yes, you can head cover, I don't have a problem with that, but they often won't encourage it or talk about it because it makes a lot of people uncomfortable. I started, well, I, when I was very young, um, I would have worn a veil or mantilla or some head covering to, to, to mass because um, it was before the changes that happened in the 1960s. Um, but gradually women start, stopped wearing head coverings. Um, but in the last 10 years or so, I, um, I started going to the older form of mass again. And I found it was quite natural to just wear the veil at mass. Um, but I was still carrying on going to the new church mass, so um, that was a bit difficult because I still felt called to veil there, and um, very few women veil there. So it was um, interesting to see people's reactions to me once I started wearing one because they thought that I thought I was different or holier than them or something like that, but it wasn't. That wasn't the case. Yeah. Believers often don't want to cover their head because with it often comes tough questions of scripture. When someone says, oh, your head covering, often what comes next is, so you're a servant of man, you don't believe that women should speak in church, and with it comes so many tough questions that we don't want to talk about, we, we don't want to even know how to interpret it, we just want to ignore it. And so by covering your head, you're saying, I am dedicated to God and to understanding scripture, and it's tough. People will come up to you with tough questions. People have come up to me with questions like, so since you head cover, you must then think this and this and this and this. And with it comes a lot of negative cultural annotations and a lot of negative, oh, you can't be a feminist, you can't be a this, you can't be a that. And it's so, it's negative in culture. And I feel like a lot of people don't want to be viewed as negative when they can just not wear it and be viewed as normal. I think it's important to recognize that even if the Bible is ostensibly clear on an issue, as it appears to be when we're reading Paul's uh, uh, first letter to the Corinthians, that there's a great latitude for interpretation, and there really always has been. So that I, so I think a, a literal, literal reading or, or an appeal to the literal truth of the Bible is often so problematic because literally the Bible can say many different things at once. Um, and there's been a, a long history of, of interpreting these passages in very different ways when it comes to uh, women uh, having their heads covered. The reaction I get when I tell people that I head cover, not only at church but also full time, is often positive from men. And they're like, oh, that's so cool that you will uh, read scripture that way and that you're really following scripture. But from women, I'll often get a little bit of a backlash that, oh, that's kind of weird, you know, isn't that too modest? Isn't that not what scripture is saying? And it's, it's a little bit more like, oh, I don't want to do that. You know, I don't want to do what you're doing. It's, it's covering up something that I consider to be beautiful. And so that's kind of tough. But at the same time, I'm confident in my faith and who I am in that. And so it's not a problem. What really started me 
funnily enough, was the fact that a lot of the young girls um, who came to Mass were not very well dressed. They were very um, just dressed like modern young women, but the fashion at the time was very um, revealing and inappropriate for coming into church. And I think it was just almost as an act of reparation for seeing that, um, that I felt called to put on a head covering. So it it was more of uh, like a call to wear it rather than sort of thinking about why one used to wear veils, you know, but obviously once I started wearing it, I looked into it more and realised why <clears throat> there was 2,000 years of Christian tradition of wearing for women to wear the veil. It just made sense. It all seemed to make sense. And then I did start going to the older mass uh, as well, and that it was just appropriate to cover your head in front of the Blessed Sacrament because it's the real presence for us. We believe Jesus is really present in the church and the understanding of why you veil then um, becomes greater. I've had many experiences with believers and non-believers that have been different. With believers, reg with regards to men, they're often very supportive of head covering and they think it's cool that I'm following what scripture says because often within our Christian culture, men will re remove their hats when they pray. It's very standard, but women are not expected to cover. And so they think it's neat that they're following their part most of the time, and I'm doing my part. Um, with women, though, I get a lot of backlash, negativity, like, oh, that's weird. They'll, or often they'll, they'll ask why I'm head covering, I'll say why, and then they're just like, oh, and then like end of conversation, done, no more talk. <laughs> and so that's kind of a bit awkward. Um, but with non-Christians, I've actually had a lot of positive response. And they're like, oh, that's so cool. I appreciate your following what you think's right, la da da. But within the community, it's a mixed response. I have some older friends that are middle-aged and elderly that do cover, and it's very standard. And they, they think it's cool that the young people are doing it too, but not within my own age group. Even a lot of friends think it's like, oh, I don't want to talk about it, I don't want to mention it. And when they do mention it, it's a bit reserved and kind of awkward when I talk about it, even with fellow females. It's something that just helps me in my prayer life. It helps me in my understanding of, of God and my relationship to God and my relationship to other people as well. Male, female, I'm a woman, and it affirms that as well. And being a woman it, in my God-given role. Over the years, it's come to be very significant, something that's very, very special. Uh, and I was always treat my veil with great respect. We always kiss our veil before we take it, before we put it on, and kiss it again when we take it off, because it is a symbol of the dedication to God that we've made. We get our black veil when we make our vows, when we make our total commitment of ourselves to God. Um, so it's like the ring in that way, it's, it's very symbolic and it becomes very meaningful personally. The best thing is, is actually feeling that sense of tradition um, and belonging to, to that tradition. Um, it feels right, it helps me to pray, it actually lessens one's distractions because you're not looking at somebody else's hairdo and you know that they're not looking at yours um, or um, you know and also sometimes you actually can get quite emotional and you can hide behind your veil and uh, wipe a tear from your eye if you need to um, but it does it helps you have a sense of, of an awareness of God's presence when you go into church and when you're praying it, it does enhance that I think yeah. The best thing about head covering is I feel like I'm in my right place with God, with the church. It, it brings me to a humble place where, when I'm covering my head that it's not about me, it's not about my looks, that I'm really here on this earth. My whole purpose is to just worship God and bring glory to Him. And it's a constant reminder that life is not about me and what I do, but it's what I do for God, with God. and. His empowerment is always reminding me when I'm feeling down, the head covering is a reminder that God is near. When I'm feeling angry, the head covering is a reminder to love. And it's a daily part that is encouraging me and helping me. Even when it's not encouraging from others, it's encouraging from God. And I really feel confident and comfortable in it every day, even though the world doesn't like it. 
but I like it. I was I was being given a lift. It was quite a long journey. I was being given a lift, and it was a very hot day in July. And we stopped at a service station on the motorway to get a drink, and we worked our way up the queue to the counter and the lady serving was um, a Muslim lady, a very gracious lady and of course she had a, a, a veil on and her arms were covered and when she saw me dressed like this she said you dress like that because of Jesus mother and I said well not really I said have you heard of St Clair and she didn't know about St Clair so we've heard of St. Francis, St. Francis of Assisi. Oh, yes, yes, she knew about St. Francis. So I said, well, St. Francis and St. Clair together, they founded, the, they began the religious family that I belong to, and because St. Clair dressed like this in a, in a medieval way, it was in the 13th century, um, that's why we dress like this today. So she said, she said, I am a good Muslim woman. I cover my hair. You are a good Christian woman, you cover your hair. And at that moment I thought, in one way we're worlds apart, but in another way we're sisters because of the way we dress and because it expresses what is really significant in our lives. And that, that made a really deep impression on me. The types of head coverings I use is dependent upon whom I'm around. Um, when I'm around believers who are often a bit close-minded, they don't want to see me in this head covering. <laughs> um, I've, I went to church with this exact head covering on, and I was told, this was right after the Paris attacks, that people were fearful that I was going to shoot the place up, and that I shouldn't wear this type of head covering because people were going to think that I converted but I was still going to church and so they're like please just wear lace or something that's not a scarf because that's got a negative connotation with it and that was tough because I think it's just fabric it doesn't matter how I wear it I should be able to wear it because it's a head covering I don't think scripture calls us directly to cover all the time I think Praying and prophesying often refers to in the Bible as corporate worship, coming together, but I find great value in covering all the time. I think when I cover my head, it puts a cap on some of the things that I focus on on myself, my beauty, my hair, my looks, and by wearing the head covering, it puts a cap on my beauty and brings me back to a humble and even better reality that God is my head, that God is my leader, and that I am living for Him. In biblical times, in the Middle East and the ancient Greco-Roman worlds, it was customary for women to conceal their hair with various types of coverings, especially married, respectable, and free women. Modern Jewish women ascribe various meanings to the act. Like Islam, the veiling of females within Judaism is promoted for the purpose of preserving one's modesty and chastity. Although the Torah only briefly mentions the head covering, these few words have evolved into a complex hijab ritual carried out by many devout Jewish women across the globe. In recent years, there has been an emergence of a controversial ultra-Orthodox Jewish community, known as the Haradi Burqa sect. Concentrated in the Israeli town of Beit Shemesh, these women are seen practicing more excessive forms of veiling than what is otherwise prevalent in the Jewish world today. However, Due to their distinctive clothing, they have been made subject to condemnation and humiliation by mainstream Israeli society. When a woman um, uh, leaves her beauty only for her husband, it, her husband knows that she is his. And that strengthens the relationship. Long skirt covers the legs. A wide skirt covers the shape of the legs. Um, a wide, the, uh, the shawl covers the figure of the top figure of the woman, and the head covering is covering the hair, which is the beauty of the woman, and the, the neck, the shoulders, it actually hides the, the figure of, a, of the woman. I think to, 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 to Jewish way, women shouldn't talk aloud at, outside, not laugh, not look straight to men's eyes. Outside, a woman should vanish. 
and all her power is inside the house. That's what she should do. There is an, a very, very unusual case that uh, has come up in the past uh, a decade of uh, ultra, ultra orthodox women in Israel in a specific location uh, where they're in a very ultra orthodox uh, area where they actually adapted Borka practices from the uh, Muslim population in order to fulfill what I, I would have to uh, phrase uh, a similar symbolic idea. The similar symbolic idea was that no matter what you're going to do, uh, men and women are going to come in contact today. We live in a society where men and women ha are in the marketplace, or in buses, they're on trains, they're on in cars, they're in taxis, and so how do you deal with that if you are an ultra, ultra orthodox woman? Jewish woman. So some people have adapted the, the, the Mus this Muslim uh, uh, practice in order to fulfill, I think, the same kinds of, um, of needs. This is the nature of a free and open society. It's when people, it's when people see what other people are doing and they adapt it to their own circumstances. So this case is, although it's unusual, it actually makes sense in a uh, in, in the long stretch of philosophical ideas. Veiling is something which um, you don't have a lot um, in the, the scriptures, in the Bible. There isn't much talk about veiling. Occasionally you have references, but it's not brought down like one of the laws, like in, in the, the laws of Moses, you don't have um, a commandment to veil, for example. You don't have that. Um, so it's one of these sort of um, implicit um, practices which are very often taken for granted and um, which are attested in, in the Bible and then in later Jewish sources um, but not, not discussed or presented in much detail. Uh, there's also a question um, of what we mean by veiling, of the different, um, I suppose, different body parts that can or cannot be veiled. And um, uh, I'm, I'm thinking in particular about hair covering and head covering. And that's, that's, um, that, that's a sort of veiling which is very often, um, as I say, taken for granted in the sources. We have in Judaism, rabbinic Judaism, the same time period, we see that in the first and into the second century, women were veiling uh, for other reasons. They wanted to demonstrate their uh, fidelity uh, to their husbands, that they, uh, so th there is a, again, this aspect of modesty within rabbinic Judaism, where women are veiling because they feel that this is a, a part of this new status that they have within, within their religion. The idea of rabbinic Judaism was, though, that women who were married should cover their hair. And the reason why they did that, uh, I think, predates Islam, and it even predates Christianity. I think that they were following a practice of some type of modesty that uh, allowed these women to be able to signal to other people in their own, in their own uh, uh, Jewish society that they were already married. And uh, it didn't mean, though, that their, their younger children, so like uh, uh, children from the age of uh, five, six, seven, uh, would not be uh, veiled, even in, in some kind of uh, Jewish context. Rabbi, I'm Jewish. The conservative movement is sort of, if you envision the Jewish, sort of the spectrum of Judaism as a line, we're kind of in the middle. My blog is an investigation of Jewish head covering. We spend, I saw I spend a lot of time talking about the history of Jewish covering in different cultures and the texts that are the origin of the practice, both sort of the original biblical texts and the legal history and sort of stories 
that have come. And then because it's fun, I also have pictures. I, you know, what I've put up on my, you know, what I've got on my head today, and try and create some community and support. Women practice head covering. Some of some of some women practice head covering most of the time in both in any of those settings. Some women only cover for synagogue. A lot of women wear either like a partial covering or a hat with some hair, a little bit of hair showing in my communities. So my name is Andrea Greenberg and I'm an Orthodox Jew. When my husband and I moved from Israel to Chicago, we attended various synagogues there and no one covered their hair like I did. I was really the only one. We either went to synagogues where women didn't cover or where women wore, wore wigs or these black hat things. No one really did what I did. So it was very motivating for me because I got asked constantly how I did these wraps. So that was a huge part of why I started my blog and online presence. Now that we've moved to Baltimore and I've had an online presence, I think it's for, been for about four years now, um, many more women are covering in this way. And especially in Baltimore, there are a lot, there's a lot more openness to trying different things. So at my synagogue right now, I'd say probably about a quarter of the women cover in a similar way to me, which is a lot compared to being the only person. So I started my blog and YouTube channel when I got married and started covering my hair. And I was looking for resources to try to learn how to tie scarves, and I couldn't really find any, especially none geared towards Orthodox Jewish women. So I decided to make my own. Covering is mostly a requirement for married women in Judaism. It's the source is from a biblical text, actually talking about a ritual in, in the temple that would have examined whether or not there had been some sort of transgression in the marriage. But it says there that the priest uncovers the woman's hair. So if the, if, if the Bible tells us that, the woman's, that, um, that part of a ritual is that the priest is uncovering this woman's hair, then clearly it must have been covered. And it must have been covered not just, not just culturally, but by requirement. Although the act of veiling is not explicitly instructed in the form of a commandment within the Torah, orders calling for a Jewish women to cover their hair come from the body of a literature known collectively as the Talmud. Veiling was considered an absolute necessity to maintain modesty in a society highly conscious of sexuality and its dangers. Women going about with uncovered hair were seen as engaging in an unacceptable act, so unacceptable it was considered grounds for divorce. You have, for example, um, the story of when Isaac um, gets married, so uh, he needs a wife. So his servant, uh, or rather the servant of his father, Abraham, uh, called Eliezer, goes off to the homeland of the family, which was um, the other side of the Euphrates in Mesopotamia, uh, and there he meets up with the other branch of the family and they find Rebecca. Uh, and then uh, Eliezer takes Rebecca and brings her back to Isaac, who was waiting um, in, um, in the land of uh, Canaan. Eliezer brings, uh, his, uh, brings the future wife, Rebecca, back to Isaac. And um, Isaac is in the field. Um, according to rabbinic tradition, he is praying the afternoon prayers. And uh, he sees um, the camels coming from the distance carrying Eliezer and his future wife, Rebecca. And when Rebecca notices that man was watching them, she realizes immediately that it must be her future husband, and she covers herself. The modesty laws found in the Talmud acted to render the woman inaccessible and unavailable to all but her husband. The head covering signified that the wearer was a respectable married woman. When you move into rabbinic literature, and most of present-day Judaism is based on rabbinic literature as much as it is on the Bible. Um, the Mishnah, the Talmud, that were um, all produced in the pre-Islamic period in, um, in uh, Palestine and in um, Babylonia and Iraq uh, in what we call late antiquity. And, and that's the classical literature of Judaism. So in that, in that literature, um, you find a little bit more discussed about what are the norms of, um, I should say, male also, but mainly female modesty. Um, how 
a, a woman should address. And uh, in the context of uh, that uh, subject, we find um, the word erva. Erva is a biblical word, which means nakedness. Tseniut uh, is another key term. Um, Tseniut means um, concealment or modesty. It's a term which has um, become much more uh, in use in the modern period, in the early modern period and the modern period. And nowadays it's used as a sort of general term uh, to embrace all aspects of what is considered to be modest behavior. The symbolic reason for, for why people veiled uh, could have an aesthetic reason. It looked nice. People, for example, would wear a wig, in my opinion, Sometimes, because their own hair did not look as good, and it was an easy way to, to, for people to function in society. Um, the other part of the aesthetic is that people veiled symbolically because they didn't want their hair and their eyes and their beauty to be the only thing that they were going to be judged by. So it does have some kind of other symbolic meaning. So uh, when, we, when, when people, when students ask in, in a classroom, what's the reason why uh, people in antiquity veiled? I always tell them function, aesthetic, and it may have something to do with uh, some type of ethical understanding of not making the beauty the end all for, for society. And that, by the way, still resonates today in the modern period. My story is a little, perhaps a little bit unusual. I started with a sort of a small covering called a kippah, which is worn by men and some women. And that's, and I wore that for, as a sign of reverence for God and of a reminder of God's presence watching me at all times. And then when I got married, which I changed to a, a full covering, which is often when Jewish women in my, in my community start covering. I mostly wear scarves um, in sort of Jewish jargon. You might, you'd hear them called a tichel, which is a Yiddish word for scarf, or a mitpachat, which is a Hebrew word for scarf. And you can get, you know, anywhere you buy a scarf. They're pretty, pretty standard. Other women wear hats, which again, you can get wherever you get a hat, or a wig, which you can get at a place called a shaitel, a person called a shaitel macher. Who, which literally makes, means a wig maker. And that's about all I know about that because my personal practice and my family's practice doesn't involve wigs. The first serious challenge to traditional Jewish hair covering came from the emergence of wigs in the 16th century. The practice of wearing wigs became an alternative to veiling, which sparked great controversy within Jewish communities and rabbinic authorities. Many rabbis maintained that the traditional prohibition against women displaying their hair was to prevent the feminine attraction from bringing men to unholy thoughts. The wig was seen as self-defeating as it would invoke the same lustful feelings as the woman's natural hair. However, as Jewish women find themselves increasingly confronted by the challenges of living in a Western society, wearing a wig has gradually become a widespread practice instead of the traditional head covering. I was really nervous about what people would think when I started covering. I was, I kind of edged into it sideways. I wasn't really sure what I was doing. I started off just, you know, keeping something in my pocket and putting it on my head when I made blessings. And then but I'm really forgetful, so I just ended up leaving it on all day. And that made it a little easier. Um, and again, when I got married and I changed what style of covering I was wearing, I was like a little, I was nervous what people would think, but it was really, Pretty easy, it felt very natural, very comfortable. I'm very lucky to say that I think I've got, uh, I would say like 99.9% .9 positive reactions. Um, for me personally, I think it's because I love covering my hair that I got so many positive reactions. If I did not feel confident or I was not um, firm in my beliefs, if I didn't feel like I was doing the right thing or I felt insecure, then I'm sure I would have gotten much more um, raised eyebrows or negative comments. But since I always have a smile on my face, I got a lot of inquiring questions 
and a lot of compliments from people both Jewish and non-religious and from all aspects, especially when I lived in Chicago and I was really the only person there doing it. A lot of people question because I'm naturally, I'm a very introverted person. I know a lot of people that would watch my online videos would not assume that. But I did have some friends and family raise their eyebrows like, are you sure you want to stick out so much? And personally, for me, I actually have no problem sticking out as long as it's something that I believe in strongly. So um, I would say some of the best reactions have been when I've been teaching. Um, I'm, I'm actually I'm a musician, so I would teach in the inner city in both Baltimore and Chicago. I would teach music. And I got some really great reactions from the kids because the kids that go there, they have mothers from um, various ethnicities and cultures who also would you know, cover their hair with scarves and do various things to their hair. So they would often, often ask me, you know, why is this white lady covering her hair? And they would ask me why I was doing it. And I explained to them why. And they had absolutely no idea that Jewish women covered their hair. The best thing about covering for me is that I have this chance to pl to really have like in artistic enjoyment from something that is a commandment. Um, that I can that I can do what we call hidur mitzvah, beautifying a, a commandment on a daily basis. It's you know sometimes you get funny looks or it gets to be a distraction. Um, when I right now I'm staying home with my daughter, but when I was working, I was a hospital chaplain, and I would occasionally get these questions from patients like I'm trying to talk to them about their illness what's bringing them to the hospital how they're feeling their spiritual their their own spiritual needs and instead I'm talking and that I'm getting so where are you from no where are you really from like... the absolute best thing about covering my hair is that it connects me to my husband and my marriage at all times and all places and beyond that, it also connects me to my creator. I really, really feel like when I wrap my head, um, I do something that's called I wrap with kavana, which means that I wrap with intention. When I wrap my hair, I usually try to think of someone that is going through illness or hardship or something that's going on in the world that needs fixing. And I wrap with that intention that my wrapping will, you know, put some good energy into the world and help resolve some of those conflicts. So when I, when I wrap my head, I really feel like I'm representing my faith and I'm representing myself and I'm being very, very authentic to myself, plus honoring my marriage and being connected to my husband, even if he's out of town, and also honoring my creator because I really feel like God is hugging my head and that I can really shine through my face who I am when my hair is covered. My covering has sort of a layer of meanings. It's a reminder of God's presence with me at all times. It's kind of a big old wedding ring. You know, I started, you know, it's a, it's a sign that I'm married. It's a sign, you know, my connection to my husband. And it's also a way that I really enjoy myself. It's a way of experience, of, you know, having a connection to beauty and fashion that has nothing to do with the shape of my body or any of that, just me having fun and really doing something beautiful. For some, the veil is a sign of marriage. For others, it is a symbol of piety, modesty, and an act of deference to the will of God. Through it, religion seeks to redirect the focus of both men and women from the materialistic world to the spiritual world, closer in proximity to God. Although in recent years, the head covering has been subject to great criticism by Western culture and used as a basis to denounce the Islamic faith as patriarchal and repressive to the female gender. It proves to be an act of empowerment and liberation for women from all religions, societies, and cultures.